Uh, Mary, we're getting no sound, no sound. So no sounds from the videos? Right. That is correct. Okay. Well, we may just skip the videos then because sometimes that happens and I'm not sure why you should uh, be able to hear it. Uh, hey, Mary, uh, one second. Um, sorry, I don't know why I muted myself. Can you um, reshare the the slides, but this time share it with, when you get to the, your share screen at the bottom, there'll be two check boxes. One that says share sound and share video clips. Sure. Let me stop sharing now. So if you, if you bring up the share thing, you should see share sound, share video clips. Okay. Layouts and options. Yeah. But at the bottom. No, I just see share. One big share button. Oh, share sound. Here we go. Share, share sound and optimize for video sharing. It's on. Yep. It's on the. They've moved. They've moved the buttons again. Um, Zoom has a tendency just to update things and like make things fun for Monday morning. So excellent. Can we, can we try this again? Yes, we can. We're going to go back again. We're going to really know this one. Here they are worrying about mom. If, if, if there's any Zoom issues, you can talk. To me. See what's going on. Yeah, I, I have it going even if I'm checking email and um, you just have to remember to mute yourself, right, okay. everybody? <laughs> okay, let's see. As we get older, can you hear that? Cognitive problems become yeah. more yeah. noticeable for Excellent. almost everybody. And it can vary from person to person. Typically with age, people have trouble coming up with the word they want right when they want it. They have trouble remembering names and they don't think quite as quickly. What's more concerning or what might be the beginning of a memory problem is people have a lot of trouble coming up with words or names and it's happening more frequently and the words or names don't necessarily come to them later. And then they start misplacing things, but not just once in a while because we all misplace things, but more often and it begins to interfere day to day. That should be a warning sign for people that this might be the beginning of a memory problem. So here we go. Now I cannot see you and I know you can see me, right? Um, I'm not sure what happened to my view of you, but um, are you, uh, you know, we can talk for a minute about what is dementia and what is Alzheimer's disease because they are two separate things. Alzheimer's is a metabolic cause of dementia, but it is not the only dementia. It is just the most common. Dementia is the umbrella term for an individual's changes in memory, thinking, or reasoning. There are many possible causes of dementia, and Alzheimer's is the most common cause. Other causes of dementia are vascular dementia, which is marked by changes in the blood flow and the blood vessels in the brain. Dementia with Lewy bodies, identified by specific brain changes throughout the brain that include the buildup of a protein known as alpha-synuclein. And frontal temporal dementia, which is marked by brain cell loss in the front sections of the brain or the frontal lobe. Each type of dementia may have distinct characteristics to cause specific behaviors in the individual but there is also some overlap in behaviors among the types of dementia. And that is certainly true. There is overlap. More than 100 years ago, Dr. Alice Alzheimer's described specific changes in the brain, what we call the formation of plaques and tangles. Now, Alzheimer's is a progressive brain disease that's marked by these key changes and is thought to impact memory, thinking, and behavior. The brain has three main parts, the cerebrum, the cerebellum, and the brainstem. Each one plays a role in how the body functions. The cerebrum fills up most of your skull. It is part of the brain most involved in remembering, 
problem solving, thinking, and even feelings. There are about 100 billion nerve cells or neurons throughout the brain that transmit messages in order for us to create memories, feelings, and thoughts. Alzheimer's disease causes uh, nerve cells to die, which leads to the brain tissue loss, or what we call shrinkage, and causes loss of function and communication between cells. These changes can cause the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, such as memory loss, problems with thinking, planning, behavioral issues, and even at the end stages, problems with swallowing. It's important to know what the warning signs of Alzheimer's are and to be on the lookout. We know that we change over time and the warning signs of Alzheimer's can be warning signs of a number of things, but when you see those in yourself or in someone you care about, it's important to check it out, to consult with a doctor, to find out what you're dealing with. That's right, cannot agree more. Any questions? Okay. Now we're just gonna dive right into the 10 warning signs of Alzheimer's. We're gonna click through these squares and there are some videos associated with, I think, each one. But since I can't see you right now for some reason, make sure that you just, you know, speak up if you have a question. So the type of, well, I'm just going to let them explain. One of the most common signs of Alzheimer's is forgetting recently learned information. So we call that short-term memory loss. And dates, events, um, asking the same things over or, you know, having the same conversation over and over um, and increasingly relying on notes or, or asking questions. Um, this is different than, as, as we heard earlier, not being able to recall a word or a person's name because that sort of uh, lapse in memory is really related to the slowdown in processing that happens as a natural part of aging. But believe it or not, um, and I'm a clinical gerontologist who practices with uh, individuals and families, many, even doctors, will still say, well, mom is just getting older and this is normal. Um, you know, so it, there is a bit of discernment that comes to, is this more than normal? You know, usually it's pretty obvious. The challenges in planning or solving problems, of course, are executive skill functions happening in the um, frontotemporal lobe of the cerebellum. And that also, even in the early stages, come into play with things like sequencing. So someone who really was all about going to the store and shopping and, you know, making a meal, anything you have to do where you're where you're taking steps. You know, did this person like to sew? Did they work on cars? What was their hobby? Is, are they having difficulty with that? And since people are retiring later, oftentimes this will show up at work. Related change is just, you know, forgetting something. And stress has a lot to do with our processing speed too. As believe it or not, um, multitasking is not really a thing. It's not good for your brain and we really can't do it, but we try. I was probably spending four to five times more time preparing for something than I did say five or 10 years ago uh, to, because of the, um, I would lose my thought, I'd lose my focus, I'd get anxious, I wouldn't get to sleep. I was thinking, of this, I was in my sleep, I was thinking about what I was anxious about, which was what I was trying to remember, which was I was trying to prepare, which I was trying to do. Uh, so it was, a, it was a really a vicious circle of, uh, uh, so I was able to control it a lot um, so that people on the, wouldn't see things and, and, and that there weren't things to be seen. It's what was, what was disturbing me was what effort I had to put into uh, to, to do the things I used to do more easily. Right, and that, what he's talking about is compensating 
And as you can see, this man has um, an Alzheimer's diagnosis, but is quite verbal and in the early stages. And, and so compensation is, is about, you know, how our brain kind of makes up for what we can't remember or having a problem with. And you'll see that a lot in people, especially in the early st stages and especially people who have, um, you know, a strong education background. Difficulty completing task um, that is sort of speaks for itself, but daily task like, you know, how do I get to that place or I'm here now? I don't know if I know the way home, organizing a grocery list, organizing anything uh, and just remembering familiar things like a favorite game or, you know, the school, maybe the grandkids school hours or just things like that. This video really explains. Some people have difficulty uh, with math or with reading in a way that's unusual to them. And once again, this is a change in that person. So for example, we all know somebody who was never able to balance their checkbook, right? So that wouldn't be a warning sign for them. But if somebody who always balanced their checkbook to the penny suddenly was paying bills, the same bill over and over, and not able to balance their finances, well, that would be a sign for them. Confusion with time or place. So just like that sounds, um, having trouble working out, you know, when things are happening, where they're happening. Um, it is, believe it or not, pretty common for people to forget where they are. Or really, I see a lot, why am I here? You know, sort of losing track of the purpose of an errand. Um, and then frustration if something is not happening immediately. Getting confused about the day of the week, you know, again, we all are under some amount of stress in our modern society. And I think that that just aggravates the slow processing or the slowing in processing that happens for many people as they age. So that makes it worse. But one of my friends, you may know, um, and I know she wouldn't mind me sharing with you, Chris Bukowski, who lives in Athens, her first sign was she went to the grocery store and was walking along with her husband. He happened to turn around and go down another aisle, you know, to grab something like you will when you're in the grocery store together. And when she turned around and he wasn't there, she just did not recognize where she was or why she was there. And it didn't last very long. But that was a very scary moment for her. And it really told her, hey, there's something wrong. So trouble understanding visual images and spatial relationships. For some people, dementia hits physically, quickly. Um, and so there's a difficulty with maintaining balance. Trouble reading. Reading is just not enjoyable anymore. And judging distance. Um, so it can be very visual. Let's hear that. Alzheimer's disease is not just a disease of memory. It can affect other things too. It can affect the way that we perceive what we see. So sometimes somebody in the early stages of Alzheimer's might go to the eye doctor because they're having trouble seeing. And in fact, their vision is just fine, but the way they're perceiving what they're seeing may be difficult. We are at six new problems with words in speaking or writing. So I do this, stop in the middle of a conversation. I do have an idea of how to continue, but if I'm interrupted, sometimes it takes me a minute to get my focus back and that is normal. But but just it it's more the tenor and the frequency of this that um, is a sign of trouble. Stru really struggling with vocabulary, like a normal, you know, a normal word. Someone, one of my um, patients was telling me the other day that she's going in to be tested because she's having a lot of trouble with that. Like she couldn't just come up with the word church at lunch the other day. And her husband had to help her with that. 
So I think it's good that she goes. Now, none of these things mean that you have dementia. That's true. But it's just an awareness of our cognitive health. The other thing that I've increasingly been struggling with are words, um, which I've dealt with words my entire life, you know, as an avid reader, as a reporter, as a writer. Um, I, I struggle with them now. There he goes. That's a great volunteer. He was on our early stage board. Misplacing things and losing the ability to retrace steps. Let me calm you because losing your keys is quite normal. You know, in order to make a memory, you have to be paying attention. And, you know, again, I'm going to talk about the fast pace of our modern society and the certain just low grade stress that we're all under. Doesn't the world seem like a very fast place right now? So if you don't, Take that moment to say, this is where I'm putting my keys. You know, you may not remember where they were because you just weren't paying attention. But to really lose things and not be able to find them, even when they're in familiar places. And yes, I have. It's, it's pretty common for folks that do have a diagnosis or, or are, you know, seeking a diagnosis it's so perplexing to them that they just can't imagine what's going on. So they, they can't accuse others of, you know, moving something. So some people wonder if, you know, if they lose their keys or their glasses or their purse, is that a sign of Alzheimer's? And one thing that I would say about that is for most of us, we might misplace something, but then if we retrace our steps, we can usually find it. We can usually remember. For a person with Alzheimer's, sometimes they're not able to retrace their steps. Sometimes that memory is just gone. And so when they do find their keys next to the phone because they got interrupted by a phone call when they were coming in, they set their keys down in an unusual space. So there they are next to the phone. If that happened to you or me, we'd probably remember, oh yeah, the phone was ringing when I came in the door. I put down my keys. The person with Alzheimer's might not remember. They might wonder who's moving their keys around because they never put their keys by the phone. So that's just a little bit of a difference in uh, the, some of the dynamics with losing things in Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And again, short-term memory because um, long-term memory is is really the last thing, the last memories that a person will lose if they live, live with dementia long enough. So it is confusing when you have short-term memory. It really makes it hard to function. Decreased or poor judgment. And, um, and this comes into play pretty early. Um, I think it's self-explanatory, but there can be, you know, spending more money or just you will see people that are not groomed as well as they normally are. But usually it's about um, timing and money and and also being impulsive and, and easy to get frustrated. The way I kept my house. I always, I wouldn't say I was OCD, but pretty close to it. And all of a sudden, everything was okay with me. It's like, oh, it's a pile, I'm tired. So my dining room table usually looked like it was someone's office, because I always would say I would do it tomorrow. And then my bedroom, as far as clothing, I would just put it in a corner, put it in a chair. And all of this is just, I wouldn't say it looked like, um, I was a pet wreck, but really I was, because I never threw anything away. I always would say, I'll get to it, but I never did get to it. So just the way of my standard of living, it was actually decreasing. That, by the way, is um, Teresa Montgomery is a lovely person and she lives in Georgia and still volunteers with the Alzheimer's Association. Withdrawal from work or social activities um, because things are changing and it does make people nervous. It, um, you know, a lack of self-awareness happens with this disease, but it 
it, it happens in varying degrees. It's again, very person centered. You may have heard the term, if you've met one person with Alzheimer's, you've met one person with Alzheimer's. But if you imagine if you're not remembering names, if you, you know, that's a big one. People stop going to church. They stop going to social groups and they just feel a little bit more nervous, a little on edge. And of course you don't want to run across somebody that you should know well, and you cannot remember their name. Um, so let's hear about this. One of the most common changes and early on is the person's comfort zone shrinks a little bit. And then that gets worse throughout the course of the illness. So they're less comfortable going out. They're less motivated to do things that they were in the past. So there's some change in day-to-day -day functioning that way. I think they, people also lose confidence in their cognitive abilities because they may not recognize someone or know their name or find the right word and they'll feel awkward and they don't want people to notice that so they feel more comfortable at home or in situations with family where they're very very comfortable with that wouldn't concern them so people tend to withdraw a little bit and be less uh, outgoing that's one of can be one of the early signs of Alzheimer's so true I like the way Dr. Salloway describes this as uh, as a shrinking of the comfort zone it's definitely a part of the disease from the beginning to the end and it's something that we very much fight because that's not good for a person cognitively and it and it leads to isolation and loneliness so changes in mood and personality and this is just a very wide range of mood and personality that again is very person centered so often it will be the spouse or uh, a child or someone very close to the person who's ha who's displaying symptoms that recognizes it because they're just not themselves. And there's usually always an element of uh, some irritability because, because of course they are feeling this and, and a lot of times noticing it, especially if in the very early stage. Another early sign are of Alzheimer's or dementia is subtle changes in behavior. So all of a sudden, the uh, family may notice the person is more easily irritated or more impatient or a little moody or have a shorter fuse or more anxious. Now, there's lots of things that can cause that, but often that can be an early symptom of Alzheimer's or go along with the early symptoms of memory loss. There you go. So we're gonna go back to the Garcias and think about what they're doing. How are they, you know, where are they in their journey with interpreting these signs and deciding the next steps? That's right. And and that's what people want to know. You know, do we see a doctor yet? Memory is not all or none, especially when there are early symptoms or signs. So on a good day, people might function very well and not really even, no one notices there's a memory problem. But on other days, uh, especially if they're tired, then it, things become more noticeable. So memory is variable. It's not all or none. And then there are different type of symptoms that develop um, for each person. So some people may have trouble with language, may have trouble with organizing themselves, may have trouble navigating while driving, and other people don't have the same symptoms. So you don't have to have every symptom of Alzheimer's to be concerned. And I think the most important thing is determining what has changed from that person's normal level of functioning. And usually people have a pretty keen sense of you know, what they can normally do well. And then when they, either they or the family notice that there has been some change from that usual pattern of functioning, that should be a warning sign to people. But they don't have to check up all the boxes. That's right.
So the 10 signs, are, again, are a guide. You are not going to probably see all of these signs. Um, so, it, you know, it's not necessary to, to be displaying all the signs. The, the benefits of early diagnosis and possible early treatment now that we have infusion treatments is makes early diagnosis so important that, you know, actually in the yearly Medicare wellness check, um, physicians are supposed to perform a memory test or, you know, a very short cognitive test. It's easy to do. And then if there's an issue, they can refer their patients on to a cognitive neurologist, hopefully a specialist who really is specializes in dementia. Um, but yes, the, the recap is that the 10 signs are some of them subtle, m most of them subtle, especially in the beginning. Um, and, and no, you don't have to have all of those. So just important to see a doctor if you have any. So we're going to talk now about the importance of early detection. Um, and we have discussed that friends and family, those who know the person best, are the first ones, of course, to see a change. You know, it's a very interesting phenomenon that people who have memory problems are often less aware of it than family members or their friends who know them well. One of the reasons for that is our ability to monitor ourselves, which is an important part of brain function, decreases when we start having memory problems. Not in everybody, but commonly, and more than half the people with memory problems. And so the person is just not keeping track of the trouble they're having day to day. But the family members are, you know, paying attention, if they're paying attention, they see, boy, this is starting to happen a lot, and the person's not aware of it. So the family's more aware, and they may talk to their loved one about it, and they say, you know, I've noticed you've been repeating yourself. And they say, I'm not repeating myself. And that could either be due to the fact that they're not aware of it, or they may not want to acknowledge mm -hmm. it. I was all adamant about what was happening to um, Daryl. I wasn't sure, I didn't know. And I, this wasn't the person that I know. This wasn't um, the person. Daryl was very, my husband was very, um, he always had to be building or designing or working with his hands. And it was getting to the point where he wasn't and he was becoming very frustrated when he was forgetting to do things or go places. There you go. So, you know, how, so what do you do? It is tricky, of course. I think we can acknowledge now in this part of the presentation that the fear of of Alzheimer's or fear of losing one's memory is just great. You know, it's very scary. And so there's usually, in my experience, always some resistance to, you know, even approaching it. But also that lack of self-awareness, which is a very high cognitive function that we have, is impaired by the memory loss. And so most often what you get is, what do you mean problem? I don't have a problem. <laughs> But we have some ideas and we've really thought a lot about this. We've gone through this for decades with people at the association. And so, you know, we're here to provide a guide, not just this guide, but the 800 number. First, you're going to assess the changes in memory thinking or behavior. You know, what have I seen and, and what's really concerning me? So you get a little plan. Even if it's a casual conversation, and I think you do probably want it to be very, you know, a low key. Nobody wants an intervention, you know. And then what else are you saying? Um, just put some thought into that before going into the conversation and really maybe even jotting it down. Even if you don't take that into the conversation with you, you know how writing something down can solidify it. You are doing that step now. 
emphasize in the benefits um, of early diagnosis. Um, and we'll go a little bit more into the benefits of early diagnosis. Notice those changes. So are you the only one? And then have the conversation. So who should have the conversation to discuss uh, the concerns? That's something else to think about. Uh, I I think obviously um, people that are close, people that that can have a calm conversation, a calm, open-ended conversation in which a person doesn't feel cornered, but that's something that you want to think about. And it's probably better not to have a whole room full of people either. You know, I think about when people ask me this, I think about who does this person really trust and really feel safe with? And what's the best time and place to have the conversation? This is a biggie. We don't really do this in life very much, although we really should. We usually uh, let things sort of simmer and then they come out through the cracks um, when we just can't take it anymore. And this is one of those conversations that it's better to have with some forethought and, and some calm. So where's the best time and place? Only you know, this is your person, but I would say somewhere where you won't get interrupted, where you know it's pleasant and it's relaxing. So home, the park, you know, sometime, when that person is receptive and, and and things are going well, a good day to have it and a good time of day to have it. You know, let's not have this conversation at 10 o'clock at night when we're both tired and, and we're really worried because caregivers do, care partners rather, do tend to wait to have this conversation. And what will you or the person having the conversation say? Have you ever done that thing where you're going to tell someone that you love a big thing? <clears throat> you're going to reveal some news or you're going to bring up a topic and you're a little nervous about it and you think they know how they might respond. So you have this little mini play conversation with them. Uh, some people do it out loud, even in the kitchen, watching dishes or in the car, or some people just do it in their head. But go ahead, let yourself think about it. You know, what might they say? And what might I say in response? Do offer to go with the person to the doctor because um, that support is just important. And, and do let them know that, you know, this might not be Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, although numbers are rising because we have, um, we have many more aging people in the United States as the boomer generation ages. And that's going to go on, by the way, you can hear it from a gerontologist, that's going to go on through the rest of this century. It's not going to stop, start turning down until the end of the century and into the next. But that's why the numbers are rising because we just have more aging people and, and the risk increases as one ages. That said, it is still rare. So, you know, rather than wait until it's too late for some of these early treatments that we have now, you know, let's find out. But that finding out, it's scary. So do offer to go and offer support. And I'm going to be here with you no matter what and through this. If needed, it's okay to have multiple conversations. That is a need for people to process. And that's also an advantage of having a of not a lighthearted conversation, but having a well thought out, I would say, uh, conversation in which there's no pressure, you know, but don't, if, if the response is not what you think that it should be or not what you had hoped it would be, don't just leave it, you know, bring it up again. And that's another reason to really think this conversation out and not have it be loaded with, you know, a loaded minefield. So if you need to come back to it, you're not, um, you're not creating something that they will dread. I will say. And reach out for support. We're here. Um, you can certainly, uh, Tim knows how to contact Kim at the association. And then, as I said, right there in your own 
um, your own neighbor is the care center at UGA and you honestly could not find a better group of clinicians and more dedicated, loving people. See a doctor, that's the main thing. We don't want you to wait because the repercussions for waiting are not good. So most people address these concerns about memory thinking and behavior with their primary care physician. Now, that is true, and, I, and, and I'm not dissuading you from doing that. I think you should. But you also should be aware of the facts, and that is that well over 60% of primary care physicians have reported, and this is evidence-based science, that they, they are very uncomfortable and do not know how to really accurately diagnose um, dementia, Alzheimer's or dementia. But if you go in with, you know, we, we know these problems are happening, I would not wait for them to refer you to a specialist. I would ask for a referral. I have some very specific advice. Uh, the care center would be my first for those of you in that area. And then the Georgia Memory Net Clinics around the state, which there are five, which are administered by cognitive neurologists at the Emory Brain Health Center. I want to give you some information that is important. It takes a specialist, someone familiar who works with a lot of Alzheimer's and dementia patients to diagnose this disease. Neurologist, a general neurologist, you know, they, they do not have an area of specialty. You actually are better with a cognitive neurologist. There are eight cognitive neurologists in the state of Georgia. Six of them are at Emory. But at Georgia, in Georgia, we as a state, um, through the Alzheimer's and related dementia um, work group that has been in place now for I guess since 2014, 13 or 14, um, built these five clinics around the state. One is at Grady. It is an amazing clinic. It's where I took my own stepmother. Dr. Antoine Trammell is amazing. But, you know, do your best to get to a specialist. Now, the primary care physician, what I see a lot of is they will refer to a neuropsychologist or a psychiatrist or a psychologist. And that's not a bad step, you know, I'm not saying don't do that, but what you really, really need is a neurologist to specialize. Any questions on that one? Yes, I have a question. Uh, sure. I, I read some time ago that uh, there had been great progress in developing uh, a very effective diagnosis tool based on blood markers, and that this um, uh, had actually um, passed through significant uh, initial research work and possibly was even at the stage of getting FDA approval. Now, I'm no specialist. I don't know if this is just pie in the sky uh, or whether it is realistic, because I do know because my family has a strong history of Alzheimer's, that historically, definitive analysis has been extremely challenging for many patients. Right. Um, well, the reason it's challenging for many patients is because there's a lot of runaround and doctors don't like to say, I don't know what I'm doing or I'm not sure how to help you. Um, Many people get diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment um, because, you know, doctors don't want to say you have Alzheimer's and there's nothing you can do about it. That's not actually the truth, but that's what many physicians think, primary care physicians. You know, they're not, they're not specialists with this. And so as far as the blood test goes, yes, that is very much coming down the pike. You know, we expect that that will be available one day, it looks like, from the evidence and the research, but it is not, um, it's not in play now. And I don't okay. know why I'm not, being, I don't know why I'm unable to forward this, but I'm going to try to go to the 
Maybe. And may I ask another question? Yes, you might. Go right ahead. Uh, my impression has been that there has been progress in developing uh, several uh, treatment modalities that have very modest success in possibly postponing very slightly the advance of Alzheimer's. Uh, and there are two or three different treatments, but uh, the last time I checked uh, with Lisa, uh, which was several years ago, uh, the treatments were, although they did have very limited efficacy, they were really not uh, the kind of treatment that provided any any really significant uh, long-term uh, positive impact. Could you talk about that? Mm -hmm. So she, I, if you talked to Lisa a few years ago, I would say the infusion therapies were, you know, coming down the pike. It was really something that only researchers and, you know, geeks like me who are involved in this world knew about, but, but they were in play. Now I will tell you that in practice, I have worked with, um, I, I can think just right now of two people that I have worked with who years back, you know, six years back, there was a clinical trial at the Emory Brain Health Center for um, aducanumab, which was the first um, infusion treatment. And, and they were early onset because with these infusion treatments, which are, you know, infusion treatments are, um, the efficacy of them is increasing and the, um, and the way that they can impact some major chronic diseases. Um, so it's not just in the field of Alzheimer's that infusion treatments are increasing and there's a lot of hope around those. But anyway, at the time, um, Emory was doing these trials and these folks are, are, are still here, you know, now. And I definitely saw delay of progression in, you know, these two people that I know, but there are significant risks to it of, you know, strokes, brain bleeds. And so anyone with that risk is ruled out and it does have to begin again in very early stages but but there is some excitement around that and and I do think that it is effective in in some cases so it's definitely not a no hope situation um there are also lifestyle interventions which I am an absolute believer in because I've seen it with my own eyes um, so that's exercise, nutrition, cognitive strategy, and socialization in a therapeutic uh, dose, if you will. Um, you know, a healthy heart makes a healthy brain. And progression, um, I believe progression can be, it can be slowed some by this. Uh, by just an active life and 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 learning all about these things and and how those interventions help, but early detection is key for many reasons. There are a number of benefits in early detection of Alzheimer's. For one thing, a person is able to have a voice in what happens next. They can make plans. They can live life more on their own terms. They can also make plans for the future, financial plans, care plans. They can let people know what they want, which can be a real gift later on. It also allows time for families to make plans and to dis make decisions about who can do what and, and figure out care and, and those kinds of issues. Some people are interested in clinical trials. Clinical trials allow people to have access to treatments that aren't available yet. And for some people, that can be a really important thing to pursue. Right. So seeking a diagnosis and 
and again, this is what I do. I help folks with this. Um, you do want to get to, it, it is best, I guess, to speak with your primary care physician, but yeah, they want us to test our knowledge a little bit. Let's do that. So here's our question. There is currently no way to diagnose Alzheimer's disease. What do you think, true or false? You have to tell me, I can't see you. Absolutely, that is false. That is entirely false and you can tell people that with confidence. It's been false for a long time, so false. Possible assessments and tests. So definitely medical history, physical exam. There's usually always a screen for depression because depression can affect your memory, your mood, your thinking. And an interview with a close companion, the care partners are just essential. This is not a disease that is just about the person who's experiencing it in evidence for well over, gosh, I'm gonna just stretch out and say 30 years tells us that you, you know, in order to really um, help, help someone on this journey and improve the journey for them and just really get their hands around this disease, there must be a dyad. Um, now, some people don't have a diet. What I mean by that is two people, like um, the person living with uh, dementia and, and their care partner, whoever that is. Um, it's always sad when there's not a care partner and I don't mean spouse, I mean just somebody that's close to that person. Um, but, you know, it's not impossible to do it, but it's certainly so much better if there is. Laboratory test. So definitely you're going to start with ruling out, right? That That's what's going to happen. Lots of ruling out laboratory tests. Mental cognitive status tests, which, you know, take a minute, um, and are usually um, usually are working with a social worker or somebody like me. Um, with that, sorry, let me turn my phone on. I did that. I have no ring, but these phones get to you. Uh, brain imaging that is important, and the spinal tap, um, the cerebrospinal fluid analysis is key uh, because it can confirm Alzheimer's disease with the presence of tau tangles and beta amyloid plaque, really beta amyloid plaque. Any questions? No? Oh, yes. So the Garcias, the, go I, ahead. Sure. Uh, I, I understand statistically, Alzheimer's is uh, more common in women than in men. Uh, is, is that correct? And if so, is there some factor that's understood or identified that's related to that phenomenon? Uh, statistically, for a long time, it's two-thirds more women um, than men. I know a great many men, in fact, more men in the Atlanta area, but in my hometown of Rome, Georgia, I feel like it was in the water. You know, my stepmother recently died of Alzheimer's and almost all of her friends. So, you know, no, there's no there's no reason we can point to, but there's a lot of hypotheses that go on. Um, you know, the, there's a simple one. Women don't take care of themselves as much as they take care of other people. And so then they suffer later in life. But, you know, aging well, staying healthy in aging, staying strong in aging, staying connected in aging, eating whole foods, exercising, those are your best risk reduction uh, strategies. I believe in them so much. I do those every day. And, you know, really we're all at risk of it, just like we're all at risk for, you know, developing cancer. And we, but but we do have agency and, and we can reduce our risk. So, Dementia-like symptoms always result in a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or another dementia. What do you think? That's okay. very helpful. Could I ask something else? Well, there's a question up there. But... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. What do you think? Do dementia-like symptoms always result in a diagnosis? No, no, no. No, no, no. Frequently, it's something else. 
Yeah, and, and what was your question, sir? Uh, I'd understood that, um, and again, my my the state of my knowledge is decades old, but uh, when I was aware of it, uh, it was thought that uh, there obviously can be early onset Alzheimer. There can be Alzheimer's that uh, uh, affects people at much earlier ages, but that uh, aging itself was a major risk factor. And at that time, for example, as I recall it, the number of people showing significant cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's over 80 uh, began to reach really significant levels uh, that at that time were thought to be uh, essentially not related specifically to genetic elements or even to lifestyle elements, but to the simple process of aging. Uh, and being 84, uh, it interests me uh, as to whether or not that is a still held belief. No, no. No, no, I think I, th I, th I think the widest held belief is that we do have a lot of agency in the way that we age and in maintaining health as we age. And if you do those things, these lifestyle interventions, then it does reduce your risk. But yes, aging is the largest risk. And of course, we are aging. I am aging. You are aging. We're all aging. Um, but I think, you know, it's not hard for any of us to understand that. I don't know if you were ever talked about brain health ever, you know, it just doesn't happen. We don't talk about brain health. We don't think about brain health. And we need to be doing that from the time that we are young children. Stress plays a large part in the degradation of brain health. We we really aren't prepared to deal with the stressful world that we live in. Um, we don't, the American diet is atrocious. Um, and exercise is something the brain loves. So that's very important. We want to get that oxygen and blood going. But no, there's, there's no, you know, vitamin, no pill. There's no easy way to... Um, to maintain your brain health the same way you would maintain your heart health, your sexual health, your, you know, any other health, your, your, you know, your bone health. Um, we just are very late to the game with this. And, and it's important to think that way, but it's never too late to stop. So if you are 84 and you do not have a diagnosis and you do not have symptoms, I would say, Yes, your your risk will increase as you age, but again, you have agency. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, you're welcome. I hope that helped at all. Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm I'm dancing a jig. <laughs> ah. Someone could have uh, high blood pressure that's out of control, or they might have a thyroid condition that's not regulated, or diabetes that's not right, or, not, or on a medication that actually can cause memory loss. There we go. Drinking too much alcohol there we can go. make memory worse. So there are a lot of factors that go into cognitive difficulty with aging that some of them can be remedied. And so we want to do everything we can to improve uh, cognitive ability and quality of life. Right. So every time you say no to the Cheetos, just know that's on the side of brain. I'm not saying never have more a birthday cake or some potato chips, but, you know, be aware. Um, Lisa does a lot. Lisa Renzi Hammond does a lot of talking around the world about nutrition and how it affects brain health and, and its impact on Alzheimer's. And she Repeat, repeats Michael Pollan's advice, which is eat real food, not much, mostly vegetables. So, you know, the process to the, all the things that we're learning are really not good for us. It, it also impacts the brain. So the diagnostic experience may vary from person to person. It, no, it's not necessarily Alzheimer's. But the stigma and misconceptions about the disease 
really, really keep people from seeking a diagnosis or even thinking, oh, I might have, you know, Alzheimer's and I'm so scared about that that I'm not even going to go find out. So here we are with the Garcias again, where they are. Well, hopefully what they're going to do is call somebody like me. Um, I will tell you that many of my very best friends have Alzheimer's. Um, I'm the lead volunteer for the early stage group for the Alzheimer's Association. Um, we have a dyad support group. We have a supper club. It's very social. We deal with the, we do the work of processing a diagnosis and we do the work of the fear that's behind any chronic disease. But we also have joy and community and connection and love and life does not end when there is a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. In fact, couples become closer, love is strengthened, and you know, we just get through these things together. And that is the best course of action is what I've discovered over the years. I'm going to mm -hmm. tell you, let you hear this. The Alzheimer's Association does have excellent, excellent resources and offerings. Please keep us in mind. Um, I like this little part of the video. We are all over the United States. And in fact, the globe, we are the largest funder of research in the world. Well, we are second behind China and the United States, but we are the largest voluntary health um, health association that has been working on this problem for many decades. And our vision is a world without Alzheimer's and other dementia. And I appreciate you listening to me today and being. Um, I work at. I work at Skylark Senior Care. We own two adult day health centers. And I wish I did not have some tours in just a minute, but in a care consultation, but I do. But I don't think they're here yet. So if there's another question, I think I could answer it. Well, you've been so generous with my questions. What about rate of progression? What should we understand about rate of progression of the disease? Yeah, well, it is... It is a progressive disease. It is a terminal brain disease. Although we are living with Alzheimer's more and more. And so if someone, let's say, gets a diagnosis of Alzheimer's at 84, they very well may, you know, die of something else and not get to the end stages of Alzheimer's. And I consider that a victory, right? Um, but the progression is... Uh, the progression is, is different with each person, but I've had many discussions with the neurologist at Emory and, and we saw during COVID really a, the decline was Dr. Ted Johnson said he thought it was, you know, over 30% increased by the isolation. So connecting with others, socialization, being in life. So I would say to you all, go swimming, go take a walk, eat good, healthy food. You can do that in Athens, even if you don't cook. Athens is one of the best places to eat. I've lived in Athens twice. I love Athens, you know. Um, enjoy your life. Love other people and say no to stress. Just you cannot afford it. You really just can't. Um. I hate to say goodbye so abruptly, but I'm going to have to. Um, it's been so nice and I'd love to come back, you Ollie folks, if you'd like to talk, you know, more about um, about anything really to do with aging. I'm just thrilled to be here. Thank, thank you so much. You. Oh, thank you. You've been a wonderful audience and I really appreciate it. It's been my honor and privilege. Have an excellent day.